In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to a lasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives power to become the children of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Please take in hand the worship insert sheet from your bulletin. There you will find the introit for this sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. Let us read the introit together, responsibly the congregation taking the indent in mind. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. You will judge the world with righteousness. And the peoples of everything. Say together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations.
suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Loving the Lord your God. 
obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please turn over to the front side of your worship insert sheet. For the bottom, we will speak responsibly to gradual. Praise the Lord, all nations. Praise the Lord, all nations. For great is, is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? But what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise in honor of our Lord for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Son of 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. At this time, I would invite the children who are present to come forward to the children's lesson.
God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Next for our message this morning is our Old Testament lesson, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 and 20. We are rereading these words. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, I know that in saying this, I'm going to sound like the dinosaur that I am, but one of the most stressful things about living in our modern world is the number of choices that are available to us. And piggybacking on what I was talking about with the children a moment ago, I know, I know, all of these options are good things. On some level, of course, they are. To have these options, all these different things to choose from. But at some level, it also becomes perplexing. It becomes overwhelming to deal with. Back in the day, there were a certain number of breakfast cereals. Your cornflakes, your Wheaties, your Cheerios. But now, there's a whole aisle of breakfast cereals. Ice cream flavors. Soups to choose from. You go to the grocery store, you find, like I said, an aisle of breakfast cereal. You find cooler after cooler of ice cream choices and soups. I think there are as many types now of cream of choices as there used to be soups altogether. Of course, the abundance of choices is not limited to shopping at the market. Our world and our society have become a hotbed of choices, especially in regards to personal choices and morality. Alternative and optional lifestyles connected with a growing disregard for biblical moral standards bring about a whole catalog of personal choices and self-serving decisions that have too many people becoming farther and farther away from God's plan for their lives. Well, it's nice to have choices. In fact, many would probably propose that having choices comes from God himself. You see, you can see from today's Old Testament lesson that some choices are truly God-given. Except you will notice God only gives two choices. This morning's text clearly states that what God has placed before us. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. The choice of life and good is characterized by obedience to God's commandments. But as God places these commandments before us, he also creates in us the new life that is, enables us to be obedient to them. So as we shall see, when it comes to the ultimate decisions of life, it turns out we don't really have too many choices. Now our text in the is the culmination of a, of a lengthy talk where Moses says farewell to the Israelites. Earlier he reminded the people of the covenant between them and God. He clearly stated what would bring blessing and what would bring curse. The choice is simple. Obey God's commands and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. There is no middle ground. There aren't a lot of choices. God really commands us to make one choice. Life. Through obedience to his commands. God called Israel and set them apart in fulfillment of the promise that he made to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12 that through you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And as God worked his will throughout history, he gathered a people whom he would equip and place in a strategic location so that they might be a light to the nations, and that through them all the world would come to know the one true God. The laws and commands God delivered to Israel were the means through which they were able to be this light to the nation, and a witness that would draw people to God. God's commands 
are still the means through which his people display their unique character that comes from God. I mean, let's look at it this way. When we tell our buddies, sure, we look forward to meeting them up at the lake right after church. They will know that we worship a different God than fishing and recreation. When our language and jokes are noticeably clean, when at work we tactfully refuse to participate in gossip, people will know that we are somehow different. When we speak lovingly about our spouse and children instead of making snide jokes or cutting criticism, folks will see there's a lot of loving going on here, and not just for Valentine's Day. Just as with Israel, God still requires obedience to his commandments so that we might continue to let our light shine before others. The exhortation that immediately precedes our text is shocking, by the way, at least to sinful man. Moses declares in verse 11, right before our text, he says, But this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. I don't know that many outside of the church. And for that matter, even some within the church would necessarily agree with that. Our sinful nature continually finds itself at war with God's commandments. The law of God is a burden for sinful man, keeping us from doing the things our flesh desires and creating an inward struggle that causes us to be lured into the wrong choices. Lots of them. The commandments God gave to Israel were much more, you see, than just ten rules on two tablets of stone. The preceding chapters revealed to us that many more specifics about how the Israelites were to treat one another and also how they were to treat outsiders. God outlined for Israel how to live in almost every aspect. He gave ordinances about property rights and marriage, inheritance rights, rebellious children, sexual immorality, uncleanness, divorce, and a whole bunch of other assorted laws. And yet these commands were not burdensome? Really? The important thing to realize in all of this discussion of the law is that what God requires of us, He produces in us. Verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 30 proclaims the good news. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Now, did you hear that? The good news here is that God does not say, you, circumcise your heart as though he were calling upon us to accomplish the required change through our own efforts or abilities. See, God isn't leaving this choice up to us. No, not really. The one accepted choice he, in fact, makes for us himself by changing our hearts. God's word clearly proclaims that he will accomplish that which he requires. Our text says that the Lord is your life. Left to our sinful, selfish nature, we cannot, we cannot obey God's commandments. Yet He will change the hardness of our hearts. He will produce in us a desire and love to do His will and obey what He commands. How will He do this? God changes the hearts of men to do His will by continually and repeatedly loving them in, their midst, in the midst of their sinfulness and rejection. He shows mercy, grace, and forgiveness to a rebellious people. Time and time again, before this point in history and for many centuries to come, God will change the hearts of His people by displaying His abundant grace and mercy. In all of his dealings, he shows himself to be, as he described in Exodus chapter 34, he is the Lord, 
merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God ultimately reveals the reason behind his mercy and grace for a rebellious people when he sent his only son to die on the cross. Christ's atonement for the sins of all people. That's the reason we are delivered from God's just judgment and punishment. As Paul wrote to the Romans, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The love with which Christ himself loved us and willingly went to the cross is the love that compels us now to love him in return and to love others. The Bible says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. <coughs> and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised. The other way this chapter brings us the gospel of Christ follows from the shocking challenge in the words just before our text when he said, this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, but the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. The power God gives us to choose life and to obey his commandments, it is near us. It is in our mouths and it is in our hearts. The grace and mercy that bring about such a change in our hearts is offered to us through the word and the sacraments, which deliver Jesus Christ and his forgiveness to us. It is the means of grace, not our own choice, which enable us to live faithfully in obedience to God. In holy baptism, for example, God changed our hearts by washing away the hardness that existed because of original sin and creating in us a new man, formed and fashioned in the likeness of Christ. Likewise, in holy baptism, God fills us with the power to put to death every day the old nature within us and to allow the new nature to come forth, fully equipped to live and serve him according to his good and gracious will. Our gracious Father in heaven continues to sustain this world in us as Jesus comes to us in Holy Communion, strengthening us so that we might walk each day in obedience to his will and serve him faithfully. All of this gracious working in us produce what, produces what Paul calls the obedience of faith. In Romans chapter 1, we are strengthened as we hear Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. What this means is that obedience, that obedience that comes through faith, is the loving desire now to do God's will, to obey his commands, not because we see them as a way to become righteous. No, but because they are the display of the righteousness we already have been given through faith in Jesus Christ. Obedience, you see, is our way to display a loving response to him who has loved us in Christ. The game of life is a board game originally created, I was amazed to find this out, back in 1860 by Milton Bradley. It was originally called the checkered game of life. The game simulates a person's travels through his or her life from college to retirement with jobs, marriage, and possibly children along the way. I remember playing this game several times with friends as a kid. The object, the object was to land on good space, spaces which would give you up to 100 points. In fact, a player could gain 50 points alone by reaching happy old age in one corner of the game board opposite from the corner marked infancy.
where the game began. Like many games from long ago, it had a strong moral message. Dear friends, today's Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy informs us that life is more than a game. And the good and bad things that happen to us are based on more than a roll of the dice or a spin of the wheel. As the children of Israel prepared to enter the Promised Land, Moses calls on them to choose life and experience the blessings that follow. The ability to choose life and to experience God's blessings comes from God himself through faith. We are empowered by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ our Lord to live a life like his, a life in obedience to God's law and commandments, which incidentally is always the best choice to make. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
be your grace and salvation. Lord of life, we ask you to bless all of our members and loved ones who are suffering physical needs. Especially do we ask that you would watch over Nicholas and Susan during the procedures they must face this coming week. Guard and keep them from all danger, and through these operations, allow them to return to strength and ability. Be with Bob and Scott and all those who are overcoming the flu in our congregation and school. Restore these, your sons and daughters, so that they might continue their service to you and your church. Enable us at all times, dear Father, to find in you our source of strength and peace and confidence. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the project of our congregation and school as we look to expand the classrooms in our day school. Lord, we ask for the support of your people. We ask you to bless this endeavor that all we do and say may be to your glory, to the furthering of your kingdom, and to the education of your children. Bless us, Lord, in the days ahead as we strive to make plans into realities. All of these petitions, O oh Lord, as well as the ones we carry on our hearts this morning, we now bring before you as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for our next meeting.
welcome you to God's house this day, and we'd like to shake the hands, greet the people around you. Not only does that draw you closer to God, but it is a witness to all the world around you. 